says defeating the Philistines was the great victory, and I agree. But I see it in another light. The greatness comes not only in the victorious battle, but having the faith to even go to battle. That's the greatest miracle in that story. David developed enough faith in God to depend on him despite the odds. Faith. I too have faith. I am not a king like David. I'm just a woman who believes in Jesus. I touched the hem of his garment. I had been sick for some time. No one could help. The doctors tried, but they couldn't. I heard about Jesus and his healing power. I followed him. I watched him. I thought, if I could, if I could just touch his garment, I would be healed. He asked, who touched my clothes? It was I, Master. He said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. The men of the village may not believe, but I do. Even though they killed him, I believe. I believe he will rise and will touch me more. I believe. Two men, two believed men. In fact, they were rejoicing. And I am stunned. People rejoicing because they crucified Jesus. I told them he was a good man. A good man. I wanted to say more, but I didn't know what to say. I'm not a teacher, sad to see. I don't know importance. When I die, my life will be forgotten. But I cannot forget his. You see, he changed my life. He made me whole. I see. I see. I was blind and now I see because of him. I've been blind all of my life. I've survived on the mercy of others. I beg. Sometimes people were kind and gay. Other times not so kind. I remember one day a little girl came and asked me why I was blind. I didn't know. I asked myself that same question every day, every moment. <coughs> every time somebody walked by me and kicked me or spat on me, I told her I didn't know. Her mama told her I had seen it. I didn't know. I tried not to. But I guess I failed God somehow. She asked what it was like being blind. I simply said, You can't see anything. And then she ran off. I could hear a crowd approaching. I asked what was going on. Somebody told me that Jesus was passing by. I called out, Jesus, Son of David, have mercy on me. I shouted again. Suddenly some men grabbed me and took me to him. He asked, what? do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see. He said, receive your sight. Your faith 
has healed you. And I could see, and I could see, I, I saw his face, his eyes. I looked around. I could see all the people. I could see what a blue sky looked like. I could see what dirt looked like. I could see what a little girl looked like. I can see. I can see you. I can see you. <laughs> I can see. I can see. And now he's dead. And people are rejoicing. I looked at those men and realized they were glad. They could see with their eyes, but their souls were blind. All were blind until they are touched by the Son of God. He will rise again. As sure as I see, He will rise. I cannot tell you how much I'm looking forward to going home. I will get on the boat and sail away. I will not look back, I hope. Rome has been, Rome will be a welcome change. We'll be with friends, that'll be nice. Tiberius, now he'll make you laugh. What wit, and his stories are second to none. He told the story once of the fruit tree. It was the only tree around, and every day the man came to the tree, picked the fruit, took it home and gave it to his family. The tree gave him life. Then one night he was cold. Now it wasn't cold often where this man lived, but tonight it was cold indeed. In a moment of feeling bitterly cold, he cut down the fruit tree in order to build a fire. The very tree that gave, that fed him for all those days, he chopped it up to stay warm for one night. The next day there was no fruit tree to go to. He had killed the one thing that offered him life. Have you ever killed a man? I have. Have you ever killed a son of God? I did. We laid him down, stretched out his arms, and drove the nails to his wrist. And there's a perfect spot for the nail, you see. If you drive the nail into the wrong spot, you may hit an artery, and the person bleeds to death. The point to crucifixion is to make someone suffer. Someone who's crucified dies of suffocation. I drove the nail into his wrist. There wasn't much blood, but we placed a crown of thorns on his head and raised him up. And we divided his garments and cast locks for the wrist, and I stepped back with my souvenir. It was the first time that I really looked at him. See, we were trained not to look at the criminal, just do the job. But he was no criminal, and so I looked at him. I just looked at him. I had heard of him and some miracles, but I had never seen the man. I cannot describe him. He was, uh... Then he looked at me. He looked at me, and his eyes were full of love. After that, after what I did to him, he still loved me. In those eyes, I could see the Son of God. When he was taken to the tomb, and three days later, the tomb was empty. And the guards say, He is risen. And I know those guards. They would not lie. I believe He will rise, but I also know that I cut down the very tree that gave life. If He does rise, then perhaps He still gives life. That is the hope that I bring back to Rome. You know, there's many sermons that I could stand up here and preach this morning about about this resurrection day and and about what it means to us in our life and how this is the day that that makes us what we are. And it's a day of decision. And it's a day when we decide on the, whether or not we believe the resurrection. Of Jesus Christ. But you know,
about how beautiful the parade was this morning. And I appreciate everybody that took part in it. I appreciate the message that you touched our hearts with. But what a parade we saw this morning. We saw a parade of, of biblical characters uh, all surrounding the, the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And they told a story. And it's that age-old story that's been told so many times before. Here nearly we've got nearly almost 200, 200 Easter's here on top of this mountain. With all the people around and, 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 and all the way up to us here today. But the story remains the same of the life and the death the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You know, I was, um, saw the play this morning and I looked at the biblical character and I made some notes on things that we really should remember on this day. You know, when the play first started out, it talked about Jesus and the Samaritan woman. And they made it a commonplace. They made it a well. See, what we didn't see is the time of day that they met there. And see, the Samaritan lady, she came at the time of the day when she would dodge all the church folks. Because if she would have been there at the time of day when all the church folks had went to the well, she would have been ridiculed time and time and time again. And I don't know if you've ever been to a church where you've been looked down at. I have. I've been to a church and preached in the church when I've been looked down at. You see, but that's the one thing that Jesus did not do with this Samaritan woman. He knew she had five husbands. He knew that she was living with a man. He knew all these things. <coughs> He didn't care because her soul was more important than all those things. And to prove that what he was, he said and told her her life story. She opened up the closet that so many of us have that keep these skeletons in there. And he just opened up the closet of her heart and spoke of some of the skeletons and she knew without a doubt that he was the Messiah. And on that day she made a decision and her faith began. And she had a job to do. And that job was to go throughout the land and say, come see a man. Come see a man that knew everything about me. Come see a man that accepted me for what I could be, not what I was. I see so many of you in here this morning fit in that category and have had that in your life. And now you can go through the, through the countryside with your life that says, come see a man. You see the second thing that that we came across a true love. And this one old brother Peter was sitting and mourning of the things that he had done. He spent his life with Jesus. He had, he had been a church person. And he followed Jesus in his teachings and he learned from him and all that. But when it come right down to it, and he had some pressure to make a decision for Christ, he denied Christ not only once, but three times. You see, what we should see in this is what's more powerful than, den than a denial is that's love. 
because yes, even though uh, Peter was denied Christ three times, Christ met him after the resurrection and asked Peter three times, do you love me? And he said, yes, Lord. I love you. There's one thing that Jesus saw in Peter. And even though that he was a fisherman, and even though he was the most unlikely, that Jesus saw something in him. And he said, if you follow me, I'll make you a fisher of me. And see, we see the story, the parade here of, uh, 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 of a man saying, come and follow Jesus. And he'll make you fishers of me. You know, we see where a lady at the well says, come see a man. We see Peter mourning over his denial of Christ. But he still said, come follow a man. Then we see John enter into the picture again. We see a conversation about faith. And it's not just any kind of faith. Oh, we talk about mustard seed faith, and we talk about moving mountains and all of this, but when it comes right down to it, you know the kind of faith that we're supposed to have? And it's childlike faith. Mm -hmm. You know, I can remember when, uh, when my kids were small. And you know, it didn't matter where I've been, what I've done, or what kind of man I was. They saw something in me. And they had faith in me. You see, I could I could stand on the inside of a, a swimming pool and they'll be on the outside and I could say, come on, jump, I'll catch you. They didn't hesitate. They knew that I'd catch them. They knew that I'd take care of them. They had faith in me as a dad. And you know, Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me. And Jesus wasn't talking just about let the children come, come to me and let the four-year-olds and three-year-olds and five-year-olds and all that stuff. You see, all of us that accept Christ and we begin our life with Christ, we are our children and the faith. You see, we're born again. Amen. You see, when we're born again, we become child all over again. We may be 40 years old and be born again, but guess what? We're a, we're a newborn. And Jesus said, Suffer, let all these folks come unto me. And all these folks that have childlike faith, let them come unto me. Because such is the kingdom of heaven. And we see, come and believe in the man. And have the faith of a child. Then we went on, and this is the story I like. It's the story of the woman with the issue of blood. She's on towards the end of the parade. You see, after we talk about how Jesus is accepted and, and how we have childlike faith. And and all that, and we talk about the woman with the issue of blood that spent everything she had from doctors. Spent everything she had in trying to be made well. But you see, she did something that 
most of us rarely do. You see, Jesus was in the crowd. And there was hundreds of people around him. And the Bible tells us that he was thronged. What that means is he was pushed around, knocked around and all that. You know how a crowd is. I mean, you look at the, look at the crowds on, on what they show on TV about Black Friday the day after Thanksgiving when crowds are running into one another, knocking each other down and, and doing all these things, bumping into one another. See, that's what was going on with Jesus at this particular time. And this woman was in that crowd and she was trying her best just to touch the hem of his garment. You see, many in the church today and many churches today are bumping into Jesus. You in your life, you may be bumping into Jesus. You know, one foot in the world, one foot in the church. You act one way around some people, you act another way around others. And you see, anybody can bump into Jesus. But very few touch him. See, we must ask our life, or do we bump into Jesus, or do we really touch Him? You see, we're reading stories. We saw stories this morning of, of people that actually touched Jesus. And they may not have been a bodily touch like this woman touched the hem of His garment. But they touched Jesus with their faith. Not any kind of faith, childlike faith. So I ask you today, is your life, do you love in Jesus? Or do you touch him with your faith? We went on and we saw the story of Jesus and the blind man. And I love the way Bill, I love the way you portrayed the blind man. And it really, really touched my heart. Because the blind man knew one thing, he was blind. That's it. Didn't know why he was blind. Didn't know why people kicked him. Didn't know why people spat on him. All he knew was that he was blind. And he had the faith to know what was wrong with him. Because he told the little girl, I can't see. I'm blind. He had the faith to call upon Jesus when he heard that Jesus walked by. But I don't know whether you caught it or not, but you need to, and you should. It's when the blind man knew what had happened to him. He, he knew he was blind. He knew who to go to. But he never said, Jesus, will you heal me? He never called out to Jesus and said, heal me. He said, Jesus, have mercy upon me. And he depended upon the grace of God to give him what he needed. And his faith to call out for mercy was rewarded in his prayer being answered. You see, we spend a lot of time 
say, Lord, do this for me, Lord, do that for me, on and on and on. But if it wasn't for the mercy of God, we would all be in trouble. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so we saw a play that we could come see a man, come follow a man, come believe in a man, come and touch a man, I'm going to have the courage to call upon a man. And then we see a very powerful story of the centurion. The centurion that killed Christ. The centurion that nailed the nails. But a centurion that knows that he did something wrong. And they needed forgiveness. And even though he drove spikes into his wrist and spikes into his feet, his feet, even though he put a crown of thorns on his head, and even though they gambled for his garments, the man that they did it to still said, Father, forgive them for they know not what. So come see a man that offers the hope of forgiveness. And then as I look at this play, it was an awesome play. As I look at us, and we're here today, I look at the parade of characters, the woman at the well, and Peter and the woman with the issue of blood and the centurion and on and on and on and on through this parade. They have one thing in common with us today here. Is that we're all huddled together under the shadow of the cross. We're all huddled together with them as people who need Christ. We're all huddled together with, with them because we've had things in our life that reflect what happened in these people's lives. And all we can do is huddle together at the foot of the cross. I want to read one a little bit of scripture here. And then we'll go on a journey today. It comes from the book of Philippians in chapter 2, and beginning in verse 5, it says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth. And that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Let us pray. 